let me first thank the Qatar Foundation for having us here today. And if you're like me, you're still wondering how you got the invitation because I'm still trying to figure out how I got nominated. Um, but I'm glad to be here today to talk about a topic that means so much to me personally and I've spent uh, most of my life working and dedicated to um, on issues affecting the continent of Africa. Now, Africa being a vast continent uh, has countries on different spectrums. But my specific focus is on countries that are uh, recently out of civil war and who are going through so much in terms of trying to rebuild after going through many years of war. This is an image uh, that really talks about the difficulty um, of having a child, a young child being recruited, uh, used in an armed conflict and the process by which after war you're trying to rehabilitate that child and put them back into society to become normal citizens. One of the key things to understand is that most of the countries, if not all of the countries that have gone through war in Africa, uh, did not start at that point. It was a process of degeneration into chaos that reached its lowest level. And this is a process that I basically have called the process of going from chalk to gunpowder. My own story is a one that has involved war. I was 1989 when the Liberian Civil War started, and I remember clearly watching as my own country, even as a child, seeing as it completely melted away and disintegrated. Uh, before the war in Liberia, people at least had access to basic education, basic health care, basic services were accessible. And when the war was, not, was announced in 1989, we started to see that those services started to go away. Imagine being in a community and all of a sudden you're surrounded by rebels, surrounded by war. Uh, my mother and I were in our home for several days as the rebel fought with government troops to gain control of our, uh, of our homes. And then eventually being forced out of our homes, being forced into a refugee center with thousands of other people where we stayed for many, many months without access to the outside world, without access to uh, food, without access to clean drinking water, living in conditions that no human being should ever live in. And this is the essence of extreme poverty. It's not that people in some of the poorest countries and communities want to be living in these extreme circumstances, but because they have no option and no way out. And finally, the stories of the millions of mothers who will watch their children die from starvation and preventable causes. In my case, after several days facing starvation and being sick with cholera and yellow fever, I was also pronounced dead and taken out and thrown in a heap of dead bodies. Now this is the reality for many, many children across the continent and across some of the poorest countries. And the question is when people have faced so much destruction, when they've come back and everything they've known has been destroyed, brought down to rubbles, how do you go back to the process of trying to rebuild? The process of going back from gunpowder to chalk. It is easy to destroy, but the most difficult part is in the process of rebuilding after war, in changing these images, to move the guns away from the children and put them back in a classroom just with their notebooks and their pencils. It's been something that an organization I started back in 2005 has engaged heavily in. I started Youth Action International when I was in the United, went to the United States. I was forced into exile out of Liberia because of work I had done with child soldiers, investigating and reporting on the use of child soldiers. And getting to the United States and seeing the amount of uh, wealth and the amount of opportunities, I said this was an opportunity that to start an organization that addressed the critical issues of post-war development, not just in Liberia, but in other post-war African countries. And we go with a foundation principle, believing that primary education is the foundation that must be developed. 
In Liberia, the generation that went through war are now referred to as the lost generation, many years already lost. And for us, we're saying, let's go back a step and let's focus on building the foundation for the youngest children so by the time they reach primary and college, they're already prepared. But that's not to say we should forget about the young people who are referred to as the lost generation. These are the young people who we need to provide the immediate assistance for, young women who have gone through so much chaos and devastation, providing the opportunities and training so they can become empowered and they can take care of their own families without turning to commercial sex work. The young men who were used as child soldiers for many, many years, the youngest who fought in Liberia was six years old. So imagine that person emerging out of war how do you return them back to a normal society? In the case of our early childhood education program, we've collaborated with many organizations and foundations in developing a curriculum that can be implemented both informally and in formal school sectors. It has been working across the country for three years and we hope to continue to improve it and collaborate with government uh, to see how we can merge the traditional uh, curriculum in Liberia with the new curriculum we have developed, which has specific emphasis on working with children who have been affected by war. For our teacher training programs, it's essential that teachers not only feel like they've been trained, but also providing the tools and materials that they need to get into the classrooms and work with their children. And a major part of our work is with supplying school teachers and schools the materials and the curriculums uh, so that they can be able to work with their uh, young children. And for young women, offering vocational training programs so that they can learn a skill, learn a course, uh, and also combining that with other aspects of life in terms of uh, about businesses, growing businesses, about profit making, about uh, managing businesses, so that they, by the time they graduate, they have a great sense of a well-defined mission on how to carve out their lives. This is one example of one of our agriculture programs in Sierra Leone, next door to Liberia. Now what you're looking at is a diamond mine. It's been mined out, there's no diamonds in there, and there's just lots of these uh, wastelands across Sierra Leone and Liberia that nobody could figure out how to use. And we went into local communities and we asked them for the land. They granted it to the organization. And working with former child soldiers who had been forced to mine on these lands for many years through an agriculture initiative, were able to transform these unused land into places that child soldiers or former child soldiers are now able to work and grow their own food. There are many, many things we can do to make impact. My organization does far more than the uh, projects I've listed here. But we can only achieve this heavy task of rebuilding post-war country if we come together in a collaborative effort. That's why for each of you here, it's an opportunity for us to say how can we come together and work together. Now I show this image not for self-promotion, but because I love the words of this magazine, the power of humanity, the power of all of us to stand together and believe and build a better world. And I leave you with this final quote from Edmund Burke, the one condition necessary for the triumph of evil is when good men, and I say in this case, good women, do nothing. I challenge you all to do something to make a difference in the lives of the world's poorest people. Thank you. And um, I've, I have five minutes for questions and answers. Yep. I would like to know if the healing process in Liberia is over. And uh, I remember uh, recently that you had pres presidential elections. Yes. And the presidential elections were a bit tense. Yes. What must be done to make the peace process irreversible? Thank you. You know, that's a great question. There was a recent uh, World Bank study that uh, showed that there is a strong correlation uh, between countries that have a high illiteracy rate and the chances of uh, armed conflict or civil violence for that matter. And that's one of the things that Liberia has not progressed past. Even I live in Liberia right now. 
but on a day-to-day -day basis for most Liberians is wondering what could be the thing that triggers war again. And we know that a key part of why it's so easy for anybody to manipulate uh, the average Liberian and to use uh, the average young person for war is because the education level is so low in terms of people's access to information on what the government is doing, how the government is doing it, understanding the basics of government. And in the absence of education and in the absence of a strong education system, Liberia had any other country for that matter has a very strong chance of falling back into war. And this is a key reason my organization and several other, other, other organizations have been investing heavily in education and educating young people because that's the only way we can hold the peace. Holding the pieces in a country is not about having UN peacekeepers. You can have UN peacekeepers and they'll fall back into war. It's about making sure that the people have the education they need and the young people especially have the education backed by the opportunities and the employment and the skills so that they don't feel the need to turn to war. But the healing process has not yet completed. How do you choose your communities and how do you broker access? That's a very, very great question. Um, especially, there's two ways. First of all, as we go into new countries, uh, before we come into a new country, we, we try to identify young people who have been working as community leaders for a very long time. Uh, because these were young people who were already there. They were already doing the work. They were volunteering. And in them, I see myself. Because for many, many years in Liberia, I worked on the ground as a volunteer without getting paid, but there was this dedication. And I found those are the greatest people to work with. So once we have the chance to identify this youth leader, then they're already able to give us access to the community because they're already respected, etc. They work with us on developing the program. There's no program we really just go in tailor-made. They work with us, we get it off the ground, and they become the leaders. What we do is a lot of work in fundraising, monitoring, and evaluation, but it's really driven by the young people in the communities. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to congratulate you for this great experience with thank this you. initiative. Uh, I'm from Mali and uh, we are experiencing something very difficult now. Yes. And uh, I'm very interested in learning from you, from your experience. So uh, I'll be in touch with you after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I wish for the uh, best in Mali. I know our president has been there several times. Uh, it's something that we continue to pray for across the region because, again, with so many African countries, Abidjan, uh, etc., you see it goes and goes, and then so we pray that it hopefully will not completely deteriorate in Mali. Do you use education for peace in your curriculum and materials you give to teachers? How do you use that to foster peace um, in Liberia? And the second question, um, how can your organization draw attention to international organization or community to um, make humanitarian aid more than food and shelter? Yes. Well, the, the, the second one is a question that I've spent a lot of time on. Sometimes I dedicate entire speeches to that. Uh, because I always say that the hope for, for Africa is not about uh, a, a food aid, food aid, food aid. Now, obviously, when you just come out of war, you need to get emergency supplies. That's a given anywhere. But it becomes a problem, like in the case of Liberia, when several years after the war, uh, large aid agencies were still continuing to simply give food rations. And what that has done has been, and it's really true, it's not a theoretical thing, but it has really created a culture of dependency in Liberia. Uh, because, you know, sometimes when people have these discussions and you talk about a culture of dependency, it just seems like, oh, no, it's not. But it is possible that an entire country can become, take such a mindset that nothing can be done if it's not given for free. And nobody wants to do anything for themselves. And everybody is now, as the UN is weaning out of Liberia, everybody is now depending only on the government. 
problem with that is there can be no true entrepreneurship, there can be no true development of the country unless every single Liberian feels that they can do something for themselves and for the country. And that's a big part of what we're pushing the young people into, trying to give examples, not necessarily examples from outside, but identifying young Liberians who were in Liberia during the war, who stayed there, who struggled, who are coming out and saying, look at this person. Look at what they're able to do. They were in your situation. This is where they are. You can be greater than them. So that process of competitive uh, competition. Um, our curriculum does include uh, peace uh, education because, again, it's an essential part, especially, again, on the early childhood uh, level. And it's just working with the young children on the interactions, whether they're doing interactions through play, et cetera, uh, but making sure that there is a component built in that's on peace education because, again, the whole idea of the work we're doing is how do pre we prevent the Liberia uh, population from falling back into war in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That's a big part of our work. So thank you very much. I've appreciated being with you. Thank you.